Hi everybody, I'm Mike and this is Mike Tries Motorsports. The only show on YouTube where the secret ingredient is every ingredient. On today's episode, we're going to be replacing the vehicle speed sensor with the driver's side front wheel on the Audi. Now, why are we doing this? Well, this crazy powerful magnet is responsible for uh, detecting the wheel speed of the driver's side front wheel. Why is that important? Well, this is how the ABS and traction control systems work. They need to know how fast the wheels are spinning. But it's also how that car calculates its own speed. So the speedometer is directly linked into this sensor here. The sensor that's on there has, uh, is intermittently faulty, which means that after the car warms up, uh, it starts to work again, but it doesn't work when it's cold. I'm not sure why, but the easiest way to fix it is to just replace the sensor. So I've already taken the liberty of rounding off the, uh, the head on the bolt that holds the old one on there. So this 10 minute job should take about 30 or 40 minutes, maybe an hour for lucky. So let's get to it. Okay. so. I want to take an opportunity to talk about the brakes on this car now that we have the wheel off. These are obviously not OEM Audi A4 brakes. They say Porsche right on the side of them. I believe these are, these are actually the brake calipers from a Porsche Cayman uh, GTS or something like that. So I think it's the SUV, uh, Porsche SUV. Um, there's six pistons, three on each side, which means you have to bleed two sides with brakes I did not know that. Um, I bled this side uh, and not this side before the track day that I went to last weekend. Um, we had some braking issues with the car, specifically related to the brake pads though. I had pedal pressure, but on about the second lap, actually very quickly, uh, the brakes started going away. I would apply the brakes and uh, they wouldn't slow down quite as well. Each lap they got progressively worse until by the third lap or so they were uh, they weren't really working well at all anymore. And what happens is when uh, a street pad like these, I think these are Hawk HPS brakes, brake pads. When a street pad like this gets really hot, it starts to evaporate. Some of the compounds in it turn to a gas and that gas comes out in all different directions. But uh, the, the part that harms us is where when it comes out and it applies itself against the rotor. It comes out between the pad and the rotor and essentially lubricates it. Um, that's one of the purposes of the slots, actually, as the slots are going around, they sort of evacuate that gas that forms by providing it a path to go away from the rotor. Um, I suppose the drilled holes can do the same thing, but fun fact, these are actually drilled through the rotor to make the rotor lighter because rotational mass is your enemy. Um, I would never actually put drilled rotors on a car that I drive on the street. And um, it's probably something that I'm going to have to keep an eye on because cracks can form. These are stress points and cracks can form in these things. And if they get really hot and really cold, you go, you go through a number of heat cycles and those cracks can uh, propagate through the rotor and cause it to explode under really high um, uh, uh, temperatures uh, at high speeds. And that's bad. You don't want your brake rotors exploding on you. So these will probably get replaced with a set of OEM blanks if I can figure out what they are. I believe they're 352 millimeter um, rotors, um, but now I have a part number here, 10912518 um, from ECS Tuning, and that should tell me exactly what these are. So um, what we're going to be working on today is behind here, I'll have to turn the wheel to show you and I'll turn on that light on the camera so you can see a little bit better, um, but it's just a sensor and it's really easy. It's located there, the, the wiring goes right up here. It's it's. Should be an easy fix as soon as I fix them, as soon as I get that bolt out that holds it on. So I'll put you back in hyperlapse. Um, hopefully we learned a little bit of a uh, little bit about the brakes today and um, we'll keep going. Okay, I'm going to try to adjust the camera and bring you in here and show you what we're working on. There's the sensor right there. It's this thing. And that's the bolt that I already rounded off for us. And that's the uh, primary reason I guess we're going to have uh, a little bit of fun with this. That shouldn't have happened. Um, look, they even give you this nice cutout here so you can get your tools back there to better round off that bolt. Um, but yeah, so you can see the uh, CV comes in, right? There's a sensor. Um, I forget what, what they call the sensor, but basically they're a bunch of uh, windows, I guess, in a drum. And this thing's counting 
those as they go by. Um, sometimes they'll use like, an, well, there's probably a YouTube video that explains exactly how it works. But um, for now, we just need to replace this sensor. And the wiring is all here. It sh should be pretty straightforward. Well, this is interesting. I'm not sure how easy it is to tell. Let me get you in a little closer there. So I tried to drill this out with a drill bit and uh, it looks like I selected a bit too large of a drill bit or maybe just the right size. I just drilled the whole head off of it. So I suppose that's one way to do it. I guess I'll just see if I can break this thing loose and get it out. And then I'll have to find another way to fasten it in there. But I can probably find another bolt somewhere. Okay, so I'm gonna try one of these doodads. It's like a, this is for doing uh, work with those sort of, uh, well, actually with these things, these clips right here, right? This is for pulling these clips off. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to try to get it behind our uh, little sensor here. Let's see if I can get that thing in focus for you a little bit better and try to pry the sensor out. I can under, I understand that sometimes these come out pretty easily. But if they've been in there for ages, I'm sorry. Let's see if we can get some of these tools that way. If they've been in there for ages, like mine has, it might be a bit more of a fight. So that's the sensor right there. I'm gonna see if I can pry on it a little bit and get it to budge. Oh good, it's gonna be a fight, isn't it? All right. <laughs> Okay, I'm back with a screwdriver. Let's see if this works. Actually, I brought two. Well, if the sensor wasn't broken before, it's probably broken now. I wonder if this is the right way. I've done these sorts of shortcut jobs before, where I've gone in and broken something more, you know, more important like a spindle or uh, stripped a spark plug hole in a head. Maybe I ought to reconsider my way forward with this. Back within a few minutes. Okay, so I have an idea. I can't get this thing out um, without, I, I don't know, I, I'm gonna have to resort to uh, more drastic measures. The more drastic measure uh, I'm referring to at this time, at this moment is I'm going to drill a hole, well, if I can, into the sensor, and then I'm gonna drive this big giant screw in there, right, and see if I can use the screw uh, to pull it out, get some leverage on it to pull it out. I don't know if it'll work. Probably just pull the screw right out of the hole that I drill. Um, worst case scenario, I'll just put a really giant drill bit on it and just drill the sucker out. Well, or even worst case scenario is I'll disassemble the entire hub, um, you know, at uh, one o'clock in the morning on a Sunday night and uh, try to get it out that way. That's that's the worst case scenario. Uh, let's see how this goes. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna try here is we're gonna use the slide hammer. One of these things. I'll show you later on, but we're gonna try to bash this thing out by uh, tapping this hole that we drilled right here and threading the uh, end of the tap into that. And that'll give us something to hook onto so we can use our slide hammer and uh, beat this thing out of there.
Yeah, I'm not even sure if this is the right size hole. Let's make sure that's the right size hole. I'm gonna have a drill for this. There we go. Sorry, headphones users. Hey, if we weren't throwing ABS codes before, we certainly are now. I'm just going to keep pulling on it. When brute force alone doesn't work, just use more brute force. Hey, I think we're doing it. Look at that. All I needed was two screwdrivers, a Dremel, some channel locks, a drill, a tap, uh, a slide hammer. What else? Easy outs. A lot of patience. Oh, geez Louise. Okay, well, there's part of the sensor. And, uh... Here's the rest of it. Oh, well, you know, that's a really powerful magnet. It's kind of neat. I'm not sure why it's still stuck in there. Well, at least it's a little bit more, uh, Harder, so I should be able to grip onto it a little bit better, I guess. Oh, and it's it's still loose too, so maybe we'll get this out too. Oh, is this that screw? <laughs> oh yeah, this is that uh, screw that I got stuck in there earlier, and that it broke off. What if I get that out? Maybe that's causing all of this. Oh man. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that, but I uh, definitely broke. Oh. These things are awful. Yeah, I bet that's causing some problems now. Now, to be fair, this thing was okay. That's still not better. But to be fair, this thing was stuck in there long before I drove that screw in. Is that a magnet? Oh, that's cool. Looks like there's more of it in there. 
I mean, this should come out easily now, right? I mean, if I have my tools on it, swollen shut. Yeah, that's too big. That's just right. That's not what I want. Let's see if we can just grip it and pull it. How about just bolt this too? Oh yeah. I mean, I guess I could just buy a new spindle. That might be less of a pain. <laughs> bolt, bolt, ball joint. A couple ball joints up there, some ball joints in the back, get the brakes off of it, and we're done. But nope, we'll keep working on this. Okay, uh, I just wanted to show you, uh, I did a few things here off camera because uh, it was taking a long time. I took the dust shield off that uh, goes behind the brake rotor. I got the brake rotor off as well, and it doesn't look great to be honest with you. There it is over there. Um, the slots look like they're basically worn away, or at least they're filled in with brake pad material, which sort of renders them useless. These are very expensive rotors, by the way. I'm going to be seeing if I can get a, a set of OEM blanks. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see, because uh, I don't think I want to spend $700 on new rings for these. There's really no point. Um, I think big brakes look great, but I don't think that there's any real performance benefit, especially when your car only has 160 horsepower, 170 horsepower, and uh, it most weighs 3,300 pounds, you know, fully loaded, um, and it'll probably weigh less. You know, geez, once we start going really fast with this car, it's going to be because we pulled three or 400 pounds out of it. So. Honestly, these brakes are probably more than overkill for the car. They are for piston Porsche, by the way, I believe. Let me see if I can turn on the light for you. I believe they're from the Porsche Boxster. Um, I thought they were six piston. Um, that's with the kit that's available on ECS Tuning. Um, that's what's available on their website right now. Um, however, I don't see six pistons. So I think back in the olden days when this thing was purchased, uh, when this kit was purchased, they were using um, Porsche Boxster pads. Um, I think it might be, there might be an SUV that uses these as well. Um, anyway, I now know what pads to buy. Um, I can probably find blank rotors uh, that'll fit pretty easily. Uh, and they should be $50, $60, $70 per rotor instead of 10 times that amount. Anyway, so what are we here for? Well, I wanted to show you inside here. That's the tone ring back there. That thing looks like all those... Um, those little square cutouts. Uh, as those spin around, um, the sensor would, you know, just count the rotations. Um, this is the bolt that was holding it in. Uh, that went in there. Uh, that was in pretty bad shape on the outside here, but actually inside the threads look okay. So I'm going to, I've cleaned out the inside of this. I got all the plastic out and um, I'm going to put the new sensor in and run all the cabling. It goes up there. Uh, where is it? Up there. That, well, there. Point on camera. It goes up there, and I think there's a secondary um, wire somewhere on there. I'll find that, too. I'll make sure it gets plugged in correctly, and uh, and then, yeah, I'll show you the uh, progress as we go along. Oh, there's one more thing I wanted to show you. I stuck a large drill bit in here to try to drill out some of the plastic, and <laughs> the strangest thing happened. This stuff just exploded out, this copper um, this copper wire. I mean, I guess it makes sense. You've got, you know, this magnet sitting in there. It's, uh, I mean, it was all, it was all encased in this piece of plastic here. This is what I ended up getting out. 
There it is. I mean, this thing was the outer casing. It was all encased in that. And then on the inside of that was this magnet here, right? So I guess this uh, magnet would move ever so slightly in and out. Well, you know, in and out of the hole um, as it was attracted to the... Um, let's turn those lights back on. As it was attracted to those... Oh, whatever they are, those, those cuts, the, the holes in the... Um, now that I've got you on camera, I can't remember what it's called. Tone ring. That's what it is. So this thing would move back just ever so slightly, and it would generate a current, I suppose, inside all this copper. I mean, this is beautifully wound um, around this. Um, almost around this. There was actually a little plastic shell around this, and then it was this copper. So it's kind of a surprise. I mean, this stuff is really long and spindly and thin. Pretty cool stuff. So that's what's inside this. Sensors. They, don't, they don't look that exciting on the outside, but um, you know, it's actually quite a bit going on inside of there. Thought you might like that. Oh, we'll see if it fits. Yeah, of course it doesn't fit. You know, that should just go right in. I'm going to clean this up a little bit with a file. Maybe that's kind of, uh, maybe that was the problem. Look at that. that mark up there. You can see it pretty well on camera. Anyway, I'll get it cleaned up, and then I'll get it back together. Um, I need to buy another bolt, because in all of the time that I've had this apart, I kept forgetting to go to Home Depot and, you know, pick up the actual fastener for that. So, um, back to it. All right, so I've got the tire back in the car, I've got the brakes back together, and um, basically the car's ready to drive, at least for a test drive. I don't have the sensor bolted in. In order to bolt the sensor in, I need to buy a new bolt that, you know, for the sensor because I ruined the other one. Um, I'll go to the hardware store tomorrow and pick up that bolt. In the meantime, I can at least roll the car around and uh, see if the ABS uh, warning goes away and if the speedometer works. So I'm going to get on that now. Thanks and good job, Garage Studio Mike. You're really coming along well up there. I think a promotion is in your future. Unfortunately, the work that we did to replace the sensor on the ABS uh, for the for the ABS module uh, did not fix the issue. We're going to have to replace or repair the ABS module itself. Uh, this is attached to the ABS uh, um, servo uh, up in the braking system up under the hood. Um, you can either replace it, which is very expensive and requires reprogramming, or you can have it repaired. In order to repair it, you send it up to a shop and they'll cut the thing apart and they'll reflow some of the solder to reconnect some of the, um, uh, the connections that actually break off uh, over time inside the module. So I may look into doing that in the future. However, we've got bigger problems to solve first. Unfortunately, we're still having issues with the way the engine runs, particularly on startup. Um, if you recall, in the very one of the first episodes, I think the second episode when I introduced the car, I talked about a rough idle that the car was having, especially on cold startup. Well, I believe this might be a bad head gasket allowing coolant into the cylinders. It could also be, unfortunately, a cracked cylinder head. This car is an AMB engine code, and uh, the heads on the AMB engines had a tendency to crack. Um, that would be an unfortunate turn of events. Uh, however, the heads aren't terribly expensive. You can even buy them at Walmart. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Go ahead, check it out. I'll pull the head off anyway, and I'll go forward with um, uh, a head gasket replacement. The head gasket's not cheap. It even comes with all the associated gaskets and seals. But while I'm doing the job, I'll inspect for other issues like PCV, um, leaks uh, or vacuum leaks or other issues that might be a uh, cause for concern. They might not be apparently obvious when you've got all the, the engine completely assembled. Um, when I pull the head off, I'll, uh, I'll inspect it visually for cracks and if none appear obvious, eh, then I'll send the head off to get it pressure tested just in case. Sometimes the leaks, uh, sorry, sometimes the cracks can be difficult to see. You checked it out, didn't you? The heads at Walmart? I told you they sell them, at least for Volkswagen and Audi 1.8T engines. It's an online only thing, but they do have them. Pretty cool, right? Anyway, if the head looks good, 
I'll look into re um, reusing it. I'll have it machined and cleaned up, then I'll reinstall it with a new head gasket. Hopefully that'll solve our problems. That's for a future video then. Until then, thanks for watching, and please subscribe if you're interested in what we're doing here. I'm Mike, this has been Mike Tries Motorsports. Keep it shiny side up, and I'll see you in the next one.